Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Hojat from SimWave. I'm a research lead uh, there. And uh, as you know, uh, SimWave got recently acquired by IMAX. So I'm confused. Should I introduce myself as part of IMAX or SimWave? But anyways, let's um, go into the, uh, the details of the presentation and the, uh, uh, the talk. Uh, so last year, we uh, talked about the, the issues uh, that film grain can introduce into the uh, video encoding um, uh, platforms. And um, this year, we would like to introduce a, like a, a, a new model that like, uh, try to address uh, those kind of issues. Uh, at the beginning, I will talk about what is film grain, um, and then uh, we will see the main challenges, some sort of a, rep a repetition on what we did uh, last year. And then we will introduce like, uh, the texture similarity index, the, uh, one of the initial attempts that we recently uh, did. And we, you see some promising results out, out of it. And then we will go to the uh, conclusion. Uh, so the big question is now, what is film grain? Uh, and what, what, what it, why it is important? Uh, so like, in film, uh, there is an emulsion on top of like, each layer of the film. And then uh, because of the uh, the, and there are some silver halide crystals in that emulsion. And some of those silver halide uh, 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 crystals, when they get exposed to, to, to light, they uh, turn to um, real uh, metallic silver. So when you go with a negative and then you make a positive or so, then you see some of those silver halides that are kind of a metallic silver halides. It appears like a film grain or noise. And that is kind of a thing that you see as a signature of a film grain. So when you um, uh, look at like a, one, old movies or like a, any, any content that has been shot by film, uh, you see that the, it does have a different look and feel compared to digital. So like, uh, as an example here, we, we show you uh, some, um, uh, some footage, or basically one frame out of a footage that we, we shot using two cameras. Uh, the same scene, but two, two times. One time with an analog camera, which is like an IMAX camera. Um, and then the other one is the digit with using like a digital camera, uh, which is in this case, uh, Sony Venice 2. So if you look at IMAX uh, film camera, you clearly see, I'm not sure if, if depending on your viewing distance and uh, uh, your angle, so you may not notice, you, you may or may not notice film grain, but if I go back and forth between these two frames uh, or these two slides, you, you, you clearly see that apart from the angle or like the aspect ratio or something, like the IMAX um, uh, camera, which is which uses you know, film, it produces some sort of a film grain uh, and, and different look and feel compared to the Venice digital. That is very sharp, clean, the edges are very clear. So um, the, the important thing is that film grain is very popular and is very adorable to content creators. So if you talk to directors, they adore um, having film grain as part of the creative intent. Um, sometimes, even if, the, ca if, the, if the, the footage has been digitally shot, so they add film grain as a post-processing step on purpose because they really uh, want that uh, look and feel of the film grain. And also, the, uh, it, gives, uh, uh, it gives the, that's a, that look and feel gives you some sort of a, a leverage in terms of the storytelling. So if you want to go to, back to the area, like I'm saying that, like, you know what, uh, it's an old movie or something, or you wanted to tell a story and, just, uh, and follow like a, a, a storyline. So you can, you can basically take advantage of having film grain. So apart from all of these advantages of uh, film grain and, 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 and uh, the, the very important thing that like a creative intent or creators basically love having film grain intent. When you talk about, when, you, when it comes to like encoding, when you talk to like the streaming guys, OTT guys, that like, hey guys, like we have this like a, a content with film grain and go and encode and stream it. One thing that is very obvious is that like these guys, like OTT guys or streamers, they don't appreciate or they don't like film grain because it's a very high entropy signal. It's a very big challenge for encoders. So encoders have issue with encoding it very efficiently. Um, and like recently, the ideas of the modern codecs, like AV1 or VVC film grain synthesis, the whole thing about this film grain synthesis model is to address this issue, right? So, uh, how about removing the film grain from the source site um, and analyze the statistical behavior of the film grain and, and model it and, and transfer the, the, the model using metadata 
and then like an uh, encoder will deal with like clean content without film grain encodes, and you in the decoder side you decode the content. The player that has uh, should be able to basically add like film grain after decoding, and this way we can uh, have a like a win-win situation. You, you can say, uh, or we can talk to content creators saying that well, you know what, we preserve your creative intent because. Film grain is, is very, very important to you. But at the same time, the encoder companies or encoders or streamers will be happy too because there is no film grain. So you, you, you re reduce the entropy of the signal and you can have more efficient encoders. So what is the, the big challenge here? So the big challenge here is that like, if you go to the realm of the video encoding and optimization and everything, the very important piece is uh, 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 objective, like a video quality model or objective video quality assessment model. So th that's, that's the key if you really wanted to uh, be successful in encoding and, and optimization. So the important thing that we realized in the past few years or so and more after we joined IMAX is that like if none of the uh, state of the art objective models would uh, uh, would, would would handle film grain uh, uh, properly or accurately so what does it mean what does it mean so if you have uh, if you if you collect a con some content with like a catalog of content with film grain encode them using multiple bitrate values and then do a subjective study so people they, well, they, they, and people, they, or subject, they give you scores. So when you compute the, the objective models, no matter what, like a simplest EPS or VMAF or AVQT that is recently introduced, if you run these VQA models, they p heavily penalize any sort of distortion to the film grain. But if you look at the subjective data, you realize that the subjects, they don't perceive film grain like the structures, like the, the buildings or the like a, or face or something like that. So let's put it this way, the, the human perception of the structural details is different than have, like the perception or human perception on like some sort of a statistical signals like film grain. So human perceives the statistical signal like a textures or film grain as a whole, as opposed, and, and they don't bother seeing a little bit of distortion in film grain as opposed to like the structures or so. But, then the, but like a vi uh, objective video quality model, they, because they are designed based on the pixel to pixel comparison, they penalize any sort of deviation from the source. It doesn't matter whether it's part of the structure details or it's because of the uh, statistical uh, signals or the details coming from the statistical signals. So any sort of distortion in film grain would be penalized by these metrics. So then, what is the, uh, the, uh, the outcome? The outcome is that you don't see any good correlation between like, uh, any of these objective models with, uh, the, uh, when you're using like, a content with film grains um, or like a noise or something. So this is very important. The other thing is that it's very easy to fool all of these objective models when it comes to statistical properties of a signal or, or, or some sort of a statistical um, you know, signals like film grain or noise. So this is what I did. Like I took one image, and then I added uh, a Gaussian, like a, a Gaussian noise, with the same uh, parameter, like with the same average and standard deviation. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the average is zero, and standard deviation is one. It's a very simple task and experiment. Everyone can do that. So you take a, an image or frame, and then you add Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian noise uh, two times. So when you do a um, Gaussian distribution is, or, or random noise or in the Gaussian distribution, you, when you add it two times, it doesn't have, like the, in, uh, the, the location of the, the, the noise is different, right? So because every time it's random. So in terms of the statistical parameters, they are exactly the same. And human perception, if you look at the, the, these two um, frames, you don't notice any clear difference between the left and right, and you would say that, well, they are the same to me. But again, if you run the objective models, because the, the installation of the, the grain or the film grain or the noise, they are different. So, and all of these objective models work based on like a pixel to pixel comparison or even patch to patch comparison, it doesn't matter. They, they, they fail, so they fail to predict human perception. Or you can think about texture as a whole, not only film gain or, or noise. So if you think, if you deal with texture, imagine that you're dealing with some content, uh, type of content in, in a content that, that, that looks very familiar to you, like a texture, like a carpet, or, uh, other, or the, the thing that uh, like I'm uh, showing you the, uh, here in this slide. So what I did, again, I, t I took one image that shows some sort of a texture thing, and then I, I shifted or cropped basically three columns or shifted uh, uh, horizontally. 
Of course, you may say that, like, of course, in this case, none of these objective model would work because even if, if, if a frame, like a, with a structure details, you shifted three pixels to the left or right, all of these objective model will fail. But the purpose of shifting this three pixels is not to um, to say that, like in terms of the location, they are not the same. I'm, the purpose of doing this experiment saying is that is to say that well. Textures are perceived or uh, differently to, to human perception. You can imagine that, that you have like a uh, one part of this carpet, uh, and then you look at that, and then you crop the other part uh, part of the, this, this carpet, and you show to a human uh, to, to to subjects, and the subjects say that well, they are exactly the same to me. But again, if you think about like objective model, they they always uh, they always fail. So what we did, we said that like, let's uh, dig more into the, uh, the texture issue and let's see if we can improve the, the objective model that we have or all the objective models. We inspired by the very, very first uh, work by Eero Simoncelli in New York University back then in 2000. So you know that he, he, he invented the steerable pyramid. He loves working in a steerable pyramid and filter bank. And then he introduced something, some model in 2000, back then in 2000, that works in like a wavelet co complex coefficient trying to some sort of, uh, having some sort of a similarity between these wavelet coefficients. But like in modern area, because of the, 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 um, the power of neural networks, what we did, and, and also Prof. Ero Simoncelli, he, he also did it recently, and also uh, got this from a Germany group, a group in Germany. So they use like a, a feature extraction model at the beginning. So like uh, you imagine that you can uh, um, use already trained my, like uh, networks like VGG, mobile net, or something, and use them as a as a feature um, extractor. I'm not sure if we do have a laser here or not, but anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so you see, like, in the first part, we do some sort of feature extraction, which is nothing but, like, uh, VGG, mobile net, whatever you can imagine. So it, what, what is the main job of this feature extractor? The main job is to extract some patches or some features out of the, the frame, like a reference frame and test frame. And then once you have these visual features, then what we do, we, we calculate like some statisticals or statistical measurements um, on those um, um, uh, patches or, or features. So we, here we, 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 we try to adopt a gram metrics. Gram metrics is to, the way to compute covariance between two vectors, right? So once you have multiple tensor, bunch of tensor out of the feature extraction, one thing that you can do is you can uh, compute gram metrics. For reference, like the features that are extracted from the reference side, and also the features that, extract, that are extracted from the the, um, the test side, and then you uh, we, we we have two fully connected layers, and then like we have like a, a metric model uh, module. This in this case we are using I, I think very simple MSE or mean square error, and then at the end we we train this using like uh, the data set that, that like we prepared internally. The, the, the data set is exactly the one that we we use to to show you that like the objective model uh, doesn't, uh, don't work basically on the content with film grain. So uh, we took those subjective data and the, and the videos that we have prepared and like we trained the smart model uh, uh, or, or network. Uh, basically, we, t we trained the fully connected layer, not the feature extraction part. So as I told you, the feature extraction part is a pre-trained kind of, you know, network like VGG, mobile network, or whatever you want. So, um, the results is very promising. I'm not saying that this is uh, ready to ship or is ready to go as a product, but like uh, what I'm trying to say is it, this is a promising, um, uh, you know, uh, path. I would say. So if, imagine, like for the for this very challenging uh, uh, frame, when you shift, uh, like we take a texture image, you shift the three columns to the right or left or so, that like all of these objective model would fail. The texture similarity index that here we we, we call it for the sake of simplicity TSM, is 92 out of 100. So the more is closer, basically, the more the better, or, or, or it shows more um, you know similarity. And then one step further, we combine the outbu output of the texture similarity index with the simplest EPS that like, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we invented and we use it every day. So we found a way to uh, combine these two. And then in, if you do that, in the, in the case that you, uh, be, uh, the example that I showed you earlier, in this case, when you have the same frame, you add grain two times with the same statistical parameters, or you add noise with this, the, the same statistical parameters. And when all the objective models would fail, if you combine texture similarity index with simplus, then you would see a more reasonable score. 
Here's another example with the same technique or same trick, basically two, two uh, or one frame, you add uh, Gaussian noise two times, and then you see um, the results are, I think, self-explanatory here. Okay, conclusion. Um, the very important thing is that if you really wanted to uh, preserve creative intent, when the content has film grain in it, and you know that content creators, they adore film grain and they really love it, you, we really need to think about how to manage this film grain in the video industry pipeline or OTT pipeline or any sort of delivery pipeline. Because the reality is that like the encoders, they hate film grain because of that high entropy thing. This is one. The second thing is that the human visual system the human visual system response to the statistical signal is very is very different than the human visual system response to some signal with like a, or some st structural signal. Let's say, let's put it this way, and then we need to think about that as well. As some, we, we need to model somehow how human visual system reacts to or, or perceives like a statistical signals like film grain. Um, the, uh, we, we presented some prelimin preliminary results. Um, I'm not saying again that, that like it doesn't have issue. It, uh, it's not complete. It's only for SDR videos, eight bits at this point. But this shows the advantage of pursuing this like a direction. Um, and again, if um, like in here in IMAX, like uh, we our model is to preserve creative, creative intent. And if we really wanted to preserve that creative intent, we believe that film grain is uh, one of the essentials or one of the main components of the, uh, the creative intent that we need to. Um, think about it and, and, and f figure out how to preserve that. And um, without the, the, uh, proposing and delivering an objective model that can handle film grain, like uh, going to the encoder side or optimization or, uh, or any sort of that will be even like if you think about film grain synthesis and AV1 or VVC. So you imagine that you're doing film grain synthesis in the, in the, in the, in the player side or after decoder. But like, if you don't have an objective model that shows you how good you are like, in terms of the grain synthesis, the, the optimization is directionless. Uh, thank you for attention. Uh, you can shoot me an email or, or just I'm here today for sure and you can reach me uh, directly if you have any question. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, I personally like this topic. Uh, we have today too, too much artificial content. So in my opinion, my personal opinion, by adding film grain, it looks more natural. Uh, co questions? Okay. Let's just make it quick, please, because we don't have Thanks much time. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask the textural similarity metric that you showed, uh, have you benchmarked it with different, let's say, film grain uh, noise parameterizations? And do you have some you know, insights on how the metric uh, behaves across, let's say, a a whole bunch of them. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. So like, um, uh, we didn't do extensively, we are doing it and we have done it uh, very briefly. So, but like uh, the reason that they didn't provide the, um, the results because if that's an ongoing, um, you know, research, uh, sorry, uh, work. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we wanted to make sure that like, uh, you know that in IMAX they have like a DMR product, digital media remaster. So, and what it does, it gives you a clean content that removes the grain. And then it, we have an ability to blend the original with the clean in multiple levels of the, um, and the grain. And then we are in, like, we're inv uh, investigating how, um, or how monotonic is this, uh, is this metric with regard to that like, uh, blending that we are uh, getting out of DMR. Yeah. But again, the results would be out soon, but we are in the process of doing it. That's why I didn't provide yeah. it here. I have also a quick question. If you like, it's the same plus metric of 91.86 that you got. It's uh, quite impressive. And my question is about the training data set. Can you expand a little? Like, what's yeah. the size and okay. what does it include? Um, so, the, 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 the training data set. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, uh, something like some, some some internal data set that we have prepared. I think. Um, it, this, this is what we did like uh, two years ago. La, la, I think two years ago we uh, uh, presented the results last year. I don't re clearly remember the numbers, like in terms of how many sources, how many, how many level of the test or something. Uh, but all the content that we got, they were from a customer that uses like a content or they are used to use content with film grain and they had issue in, 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 uh, in optimization and, and bitrate saving basically using Simplus. They share the content with us and say that well, we, when we use Simplus, it doesn't give us like a bitrate savings. 
And then we had to do the subjective experiment because at the beginning we thought that maybe it, it, uh, this is them that they are not really using Simplus uh, in the right way or so. So we, we collected data from that, that particular customer, we encoded into multiple bitrate values, and then we conducted subjective study. But we conducted subjective study not with naive people, with expert people this time. So we, we con uh, conducted subject subjective study uh, in uh, in inside SimWave, and also the, uh, the particular uh, customers, we shared content with them as well. Okay, thank you very much.